Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the PIH webinar. It is Giving Tuesday and like every year I get to sit down and talk with Dr. Paul Farmer and I'm so happy that I get this chance. It's like my holidays come early, Paul, every year. Um, and we're going to wait a couple seconds as people uh, sign in. I see the numbers ticking up. Uh, we had a good number of people who wanted to join us today. Um, and just a point of uh, some technical uh, orientation here. If you have not um, joined Zoom before, it's great to have uh, the speaker view here in uh, gallery mode, if you, if you like that. Um, we're, we should be side to side. There are no slides today. So we're just having a, an informal conversation. All right. you, think there's, you think there's anyone who doesn't know Zoom by this point? No, I was thinking about that. Do I need to go there? I don't think so. We're now how many months in? Um, so, Paul, I, I want to introduce you. You are a, a PIH co-founder, our chief strategist. You're also the Cola Catrones University professor at Harvard Medical School and uh, just an all-around wonderful person. You're also the author of uh, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds here, which was released within recent weeks. So um, we are going to be speaking about your new book. We'll also be talking a little bit about uh, COVID work and our advocacy here in the United States and globally in response to the pandemic. So um, I want to let everybody know that we received more than 200 questions for you, Paul. I will not ask you all 200 questions. Uh, but I do want to let everybody know, thank you for, um, for submitting them, and we will try to get as many uh, in through uh, as we can uh, tonight. By the way, I will, I will just say I will uh, try to avoid looking at the chat. I just got a note from a friend of mine in Ouagadougou. Oh, wow. So uh, that oh. was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, so here we are, uh, we'll be providing a recording of this session. If you know people who weren't able to attend, uh, there will be a recording and we'll send around that link later. So welcome to everyone. Um, I think we can start in, Paul. Um, so welcome. And I have some questions for you. Um, it's like we said, Giving Tuesday. So as you're thinking about these, uh, these responses and, and absorbing the information, if you're inspired, go to PIH.org. There's a triple match. Please consider giving if you haven't already. And if you have, thank you. Uh, so Paul, um, I have some questions for you first. I hope you don't mind us digging into those. So I'm reading your book. And uh, as a writer, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how you approached a couple chapters, two of which were dedicated, at least two, to Yabom and Ibrahim, who are Ebola survivors, right? And I believe it was Ibrahim, right, who actually said to you, uh, please interview me. He wanted to tell you his story. So I, I feel like um, that's such a great responsibility and a privilege, right? When you got done with their chapters, did you feel like you had done them justice? And have they seen those chapters? What do they think about? Wow. Well, you know, um, I, I, I was saying in, in writing the, this book that having someone ask me to interview them uh, was an un unfamiliar experience to me. You know, I, I've been doing this work as a physician and an anthropologist for a long time. But I really, you know, in Haiti, it was, it was like, sit down, you need to listen. So that was in a way asking me to listen to their stories. But Ibrahim's request I had never met him before. He had just gotten out of an Ebola treatment unit. He'd lost, you know, so much of his family. And, uh, and, and I, it was really, in a way, his talking to him, which I started interviewing him right away, but talking to him really is what gave me the idea for the book. And um, Yabom, uh, who I helped shepherd through her illness, um, was an even more compelling person to me. Just the mechanics of it, uh, they have heard this. Um, both of them speak other languages uh, in addition to English, um, a different kind of English maybe. We had often the need for translators because they, their native tongues are different. But um, I, I asked Byler Berry, uh, who is our was in many ways uh, a protagonist of this effort as well, um, if he would make sure and 
and read it to them in Creo, which is the lingua franca of Sierra Leone. And, uh, and I have reason to believe uh, that they were very happy with it. It's such a, a couple of sad stories. They're both inspiring, but it's sad enough that I had difficulty. Yeah, no, understandably. And, and I think that's, that's so difficult to tell their stories and absorb it. I can imagine emotionally it had to be trying too as you're sitting down to do it. Um, and reading your book too, I came across many phrases from Ebola times, right? That are too familiar to all of us now, right? Social distancing, isolation, quarantine, contact tracing. And I thought this must all sound so familiar and, and frightening for people who have lived through Ebola and other terrible epidemics. Um, do you believe those memories are, are part of the reason that the public health measures are abided by more closely in places where people have lived through these types of horrible circumstances? Well, I think a lot of the people that Partners in Health serves have a rank familiarity with um, epidemic disease, uh, which you know is, is troublesome, right? Because we would like people not to have that rank familiarity. Um, and I think that it has an impact on their understanding of what they're called to do to protect themselves and their family. So yes, I do think that they have just more proximity to the problems. At the same time, you know, uh, Whenever there's mistrust, uh, there will be efforts uh, or resistance um, to even things that we would, would favor. So, and this wasn't my first rodeo, Leslie. I mean, I, I was familiar with these terms from you know, decades of responding to infectious outbreaks. And maybe none of them was as scary as Ebola, but you know, cholera in Haiti, early days of HIV, drug-resistant TB, which is airborne, like like uh, in some ways similar to COVID-19. These were very familiar uh, to me as well. One of the, since you're a writer, uh, I will just say, even a year ago, um, as I was finishing this book, um, my editor, who's the executive editor of Farrar Strauss, um, you know, was a little concerned about the epidemiologic jargon in hmm. terms, but well, once COVID started, uh, which was which happened just as I was finishing the book, um, he he said, "Don't worry about my concerns." Now you know your American audience is all too familiar. I mean, flattening the curve, contact tracing, you know, the idea between something being mandatory or something being suggested—all that was just very familiar yeah. uh, to me ahead of time but it became familiar and it is increasingly familiar, I think, to Americans. And you added an epilogue, right, to the book because of all of this to, to bridge that gap, right? Uh, it, and there really isn't that much of a gap anymore, as you mentioned, but you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of the fear that people have too when they find out their diagnosis, the questions about what they should do, if they can tell people, the stigma involved. I feel like all of this really is a, is a chilling reminder, right? Uh, indeed, indeed, it, it, it was. I was so glad that they gave me the opportunity to write that little piece. It was easy to write, actually, uh, in, in the beginning of April, in part because I could talk about Partners in Health's work in, 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 the, in Massachusetts and, and elsewhere. And that was important. And it may have slowed things down a little bit, but I'm glad I got a chance to do it. Yeah, and you know, it's it's funny because I'm reading the book too and, and uh, you address directly some of those cultural misperceptions, I think, or the tendency to blame culture, this undertone of racism to an international media's representation of Ebola in West Africa. And now, you know, the United States is the epicenter of the COVID pandemic, really. Um, yet you don't hear or read as much uh, analysis about culture being the reason for uh, such a poor handling of the virus. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I think that you said um, an undertone of racism, but you know, often enough, it's not even an undertone. It's, what is it, an overtone, a tone? You know, it's pretty uh, stark. That's not really the, you know, what, what I saw in the mainstream media. Um, there you could find undertones or just a lack of time uh, to explore deeply why some of these ideas might be linked to racism, right? I think in the United States, you know, um, 
So in other words, as you're, as you're implying, there was a lot of discussion about culture, attitudes, beliefs of the natives. And interestingly, that was the term used, is still the term used uh, across much of that continent, which is bizarre to me, right? Um, not, you know, not so much in Rwanda, but it was, uh, for example, anytime we talked about anything to do with superstition and go through that list, the term that my uh, Sierra Leonean colleagues used was native business. So that's how striking that was. And yet, you know, when someone who looked more like me got sick in West Africa, there wasn't discussion of our culture, right? So in the United States uh, right now, I think you can still find these discussions of culture, behavior, attitudes. And it's when you talk about the racialization of COVID and then you start, are able to start talking about the culture of prisoners, of you know, Native Americans, of African Americans. So you see the same kind of pathologies decade in and decade out of attributing, let's just use a, a term that's kind of an elegant structural risk to individual preoccupations. It's very, very front and center in the United States. It's just, uh, it's just an undertone. You have to dig it out. But I, I think one of the reasons, of course, that we're not talking about culture is because, you know, we're talking about white people. And mm -hmm. that's what I saw in Haiti, in Rwanda, in West Africa, and now in the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I, I just want to indicate to people who are curious about the title of your book, I'm going to say it, but it's also in the chat, and it's right here, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, Ebola, and the Ravages of History. So um, it's, it's a good one, Paul. It's heavy. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't write a lot of little light books. I must no, say. no, this is not a, a light affair here. And I have one more question, then I want to jump into everybody else's, right? So Ebola and, and COVID-19 are considered caregivers diseases in that frontline health workers are often the ones who suffer the most. They, they get sick and unfortunately often die, uh, especially early on. Uh, so knowing that, I'm, I'm amazed when clinicians express shame that, yeah. that they fell ill. Um, how do you explain that? Well, I think it varies from illness to illness, right? So um, whether we're talking about HIV or TB or Ebola or COVID, the striking thing is in every instance, there's shame involved. And that must be because we shame people too much, right? That's why I don't go in for shaming, COVID shaming around masks and other things that I regard as essential and that I think should be mandatory, but it's, it's a dead end street. You know, what, what next? Are we gonna shame people for obesity? You know, um, so the, the answer to the question I think is, there's shame involved because we're involved in shaming people. And we, you know, it's just, I, I wish we would not as a species do that. People, all people, uh, the flesh is heir to illness and injury. And uh, we should be more aware of the fact that even with a slow decline from let's say dementia or uh, a malignancy, there's shame involved. And the shame changes over time. Susan Sontag wrote a book about cancer, which was really all about stigma. And that, lightened over the years since she first wrote that book in the 70s and then when she wrote another one it was about aids and she said hey this is what i was talking about with cancer the general rebuke to optimism she said is now uh something we can see around around aids and i i bought that analysis mm -hmm. well thank you and and i want to dive into everyone else's questions because we do have so many of them so um and, and I do see some comments on the chat. Uh, today is Giving Tuesday. So uh, we uh, would love for you all to consider donating, if you haven't already, to PIH.org. And you'll see plenty of opportunity. There's a triple match uh, for your donation going on right now. Um, this first question, Paul, is related to COVID. So um, what would you advise? Before you leave the triple match. So what's that? Before you leave the triple match. Yes. Okay. So no matter if I, if I, if I give something uh, between now and when, will it be matched? I think at least the end of the day, if it's not extended. So whatever you donate, three times that will be given. All right. All right. I'm not a mathematician, Paul, but. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about the timing of a. Yes. Time. No, that's a very good point. 
Um, so folks want to know a little bit more about your, your perspective on, on COVID and management here in the United States, right? What would you advise or what's, what's you know, what are the key pillars to effective management of, of COVID? Uh, probably globally, but this particular question was in the United States. Well, I mean, there's, there, there's at least a number of boxes in which we would class our management, right? There's clinical management. And uh, speaking as a clinician, I can say, the amount of progress made just over the last several months in terms of understanding how to better manage the disease, I think is impressive even without new and specific therapeutic agents. Um, the management of control or containment is a much more um, fraught matter in the United States. Um, so if, if, if I could be in, if I could just, if you'll indulge me for a second, Leslie, in the book I describe in West Africa, clinical nihilism, uh, that is, hey, there's nothing we can do for these patients, they're too sick, we don't have specific therapies, that's clinical nihilism. And we've seen it with AIDS, drug resistant TB, everything afflict, afflicting people living in poverty. And that's really the main challenge that a lot of partners and health people face in, you know, in the field. And it, it's not just outside the United States, you know, you'll, uh, you'll see it uh, uh, for people marginalized by racism and poverty in the United States as well. But what we're really seeing in the United States is containment nihilism, right? That there's nothing we can do. We're too overwhelmed. Contact tracing is beyond our, our reach now. And, you know, that, that's been a more troubling feature here in the United States, I think. It's hard to pull off clinical nihilism in the United States, you know, to say, hey, we have a different standard of care for Brooklyn and Manhattan. I don't think that would go over in the United States. I think it would be widely resisted. Or, you know, on Navajo Nation, we have a different standard of care. It's lower. Uh, you know, that's been tried before and rejected roundly uh, in, in Navajo, for example. And it goes on and on. So I, I think what we're stuck with right now that we have to surmount is containment nihilism. How can we slow down transmission? Now we can't let up on improved clinical care, which requires new tools. Um, a vaccine obviously is an important tool, but I'm talking about medical interventions and diagnostic ones. We need that to proceed. But right now we're, we're facing a different problem than what we saw in West Africa. Uh, and that is containment nihilism. A clumsy term, I know, but it's again, the idea that we can't do anything to stop this, it's beyond our control now. That's uh, lethal logic. Right. I, I see in recent articles about that too. Contact tracing is not working. But how many people are doing contact tracing in these uh, communities where the virus is running really rampant and, and you can't do that work with a, a small number of people? You know, just to add, add some perspective on this, you know, when we hear um, calls for a massive investment in contact tracing with 100,000 new contact tracers, that's nothing. We're a huge, diverse, dynamic country, 330 something million people. In Rwanda, where there's less than 12 million people, they already mustered and trained 60,000 mm -hmm. contact tracers. And no wonder they're doing better uh, on containing the illness. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really have to you know, set our aspirations a lot higher, I think, to expect to bring this under control here. And that, that feeds into a question, too, uh, that someone brought up. I'm glad you mentioned Rwanda, Paul, because the response has been so robust there, right? So how do you explain the fact that most of Africa has done better than the rest of the world in handling COVID-19? Uh, so kind of feeding into that last response of yours. Well, I'm familiar with the arguments that this is all based on their, their age structure, a younger population. Um, I don't buy that. Yes, they have a younger population. Yes, that will influence both transmission and disease course. But that's, that really uh, undervalues the hard work that's been done, certainly a place like Rwanda. Um, now, there are some other reasons, and one of them you mentioned at the beginning, that is a rank familiarity with epidemic disease. Rwanda, for example, had just grappled successfully with an outbreak of Ebola on their Western flank in the Democrat and the DRC, right? So they had already, you know, been talking about contact tracing. They knew what contact tracing was, which is something that we found 
uh, was not the case in the United States, that there was not a, a widespread knowledge of what that was. In Rwanda, there is. Uh, there, was also, uh, there were also early efforts to uh, shut down um, transmission across borders, mm -hmm. uh, which is very hard to do, especially for you know, a giant country with ours, like ours with open borders like the United States. Mm -hmm. But Rwanda managed to do a lot on the containment side without sacrificing care. And that's why I think they have had not only a very uh, small epidemic, but a very good clinical response and low case fatality rate uh, that compares favorably also to the United States. Um, so, you know, there are lots of different reasons. Some of them are uh, specific to a, a country, like Rwanda is exceptional in that regard, and others, uh, uh, that are probably related to these broader uh, matters, rank familiarity with the disease, lower age structure, efforts to coordinate prevention and care that started early. Um, and maybe some of it is, you know, fortune, right? Um, none of these uh, countries, with probably some exceptions in the North or, or in the South and South Africa, have the kind of um, uh, economic and connectivity that, that a giant nation like that one does. Mm -hmm. uh, like ours does, sorry. Mm -hmm. no, that's, that's very fair. And, you know, thinking about uh, vaccines being very much in the conversation right now. So one question we had uh, was, how can we, or what can we do to ensure that the COVID vaccinations get fairly distributed to, to developing nations and people? And I think, you know, this really uh, hits at the heart of it, right? That, that people who are in vulnerable positions or in impoverished communities how do we make sure that folks uh, there also have access to vaccination? Well, you know, the first thing to do is to acknowledge that there is no platform or template for just distribution of a new medical technology like this. Uh, there just isn't. It usually takes forever, whether it's smallpox or polio, two diseases that have largely been, uh, one eradicated, the other largely brought under control, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, it's decades of hard work. So first we need to acknowledge that we don't have a good tracker, track record and that uh, we're gonna have to fight, right? And the second is to say, uh, okay, the people who are first in line in terms of risk should be the first in line in terms of the vaccine. And, you know, if we're gonna call people essential workers and then treat them as if they're inessential, we're gonna see the kind of results that we've seen to date. If we're gonna call them essential workers and make sure they're first in line, it's gonna be a different story going forward. And then there are groups of people whose agency has been stripped away, right? And to take the most extreme example, prisoners, yeah. right? If you're in prison and are exposed to outbreaks of tuberculosis or COVID or anything else, uh, that, that's basically a human rights violation. And, and could and probably a legal violation. After all, people go to prison or jail, even in the best cases, they go to prison as punishment, not for punishment, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there you go. I mean, uh, you wouldn't call them essential, essential uh, workers unless they were being exploited for their labor, which many prisoners are. But if you realize that you've ripped away their agency, then again, they have to be at the top of the list, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there are people uh, who are well prepared to try and identify people most in need and most at risk, and then saying, how can we stagger this? And, and we're just talking about inside the United States. Now, when we talk about the globe, that's when you really see the challenge. And we're just going to have to do an enormous amount of work uh, to make, and militant work to make sure we have the vaccine in our hands, uh, uh, you know, across the world. And uh, the current platforms uh, like Gavi, the Global Alliance Vaccine Initiative, um, we know that they're on our side, but we also know that it's not gonna be anywhere near enough, neither is COVAX. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do on that front. I think Partners in Health is gonna have a, an important role. First of all, uh, Sheila Davis and others uh, regard this as a ranking, the director of partners health, re regard this as a ranking priority for us in all the dozen places where we work. Mm -hmm. And in those places, we're likely to have a significant voice uh, in some places like in Rwanda, because we've been there a long time, we're regarded as reliable 
and uh, or dependable allies inside the country. Haiti, I need hardly say, you know, Partners in Health is far and away the largest health NGO in the country. It's all Haitian and Haitian run. Uh, that team, Wanden team, uh, they'll have a lot of say. But even in places where we haven't worked long, like Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, we're, uh, we've been involved uh, from the beginning in the COVID response at the invitation of the authorities. So I think, you know, we're in a position to have a big say. Let me just go back and give my Haitian colleagues a big shout out. Um, they have also been responsible uh, for uh, putting together a national referral center for the severely ill with COVID right there in middle, in the middle of central Haiti. So uh, if they don't have a say, people like Loon Vio and others on our team there, that would be a big mistake, which I don't think people in Haiti are willing to make. They'll say, whether authorities or local populations, they'll say, we trust uh, Zami Lasmonte, Partners in Health Haiti, and they've been here for decades and uh, they should steer us and I think we're gonna see versions of that all over, even though we're not representing the public authorities, we work with the public authorities. And that will stand us in good stead, I believe, from Navajo to, you know, should it be necessary, Siberia. Right, I think it's also interesting, kind of the nihilism behind this idea of, well, if it's a two vaccinations process, people won't, you know, abide by that. Which is interesting because if you think about the, the cholera vaccination campaigns that we've run in places like Haiti and Sierra Leone, right? That was two vaccinations and all oral and something like 90% of the population being covered. So it's, yep. it's, it's kind of crazy to, to let me, also hear that, right? That let, me bring up, let me bring up uh, HPV vaccine, mm -hmm. human papilloma virus vaccine, which prevents most cases of cervical cancer. That's an injection and, you know, with all the attendant complications and complexities. And uh, when our Haitian colleagues uh, did a vaccine campaign with HPV in central Haiti, um, more than 90% uh, of, these were largely for girls and women, more than 90% returned for a second dose. Um, and that's, you know, as high as, Rwanda, but Rwanda, that's on a national scale, right? Whereas in Haiti, it was on the Zami La Sante scale, right? But it just shows you, as with an oral vaccine like cholera, that even when you have other complications, you can reach high levels of coverage. Of course, I'm familiar with the fact that one of the vaccines requires super duper low temperatures, um, and uh, that's gonna make it more logistically complicated but there, there's another vaccine that doesn't require such super duper low temperatures. And no doubt there will be many more. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things we have to do is crush the nihilism that would have us say, oh, we can't do this at this pace. We can't expect people in rural areas without electricity or who are not in school, or their businesses shut down, their work hampered by uh, travel restrictions. We can't expect them to uh, line up for the vaccine. I don't believe it for a minute. Mm -hmm. Great. They would. They, they know they will. <laughs> they will. And uh, to shift now from COVID a bit to advocacy around this issue, right? Uh, so we had a number of questions submitted too on that topic. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious if you could talk in a general sense, Paul, uh, because of your experience in responding to epidemics, what are the, the top indicators or health initiatives that the, uh, that the United States should invest in to improve global health and the health of its citizens. So this is kind of more broad, right? You know, about universal health uh, coverage per se. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, prepared to go into specifics in any case because it's early to understand or to know exactly what the incoming administration will do, right? They really haven't, you know, uh, turned to specific people yet on the health front, but it's quite clear that it's a team that's familiar with the, the, the challenges of covering the uninsured in the United States. After all, uh, a lot of people on those teams are the ones who push for the Accountable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you, you don't have to read uh, President Obama's memoir to know that that was a, a bitter struggle and got through, uh, if, if a thing can have teeth or skin, it got through by the skin of its teeth. Um, so we're still not done there. We still 
have a long way to go before we can say with some pride as a nation, we have universal coverage. And we could, we have the resources clearly. Um, and, uh, and we, you know, I'm just gonna say it, I think we must, I think we really have to put that, which we call at Partners in Health, health system strengthening. Mm. We have to move that forward. And that involves insurance, um, including unemployment insurance, you know, funeral insurance, et cetera. All the things that we're deploring as absent in many of the places we work there, act, they're not absent now. Like in Rwanda, there's been really hard work on building a national health insurance system. And more than 90% people, percent of people are involved in that as well. So I think we have some of that to do as well. At the same time, what happens in the United States matters across the world for very, a very diverse set of reasons. And what happens to our, uh, I mean, I'm reluctant to call it foreign assistance or aid, mm -hmm. to our efforts to support um, healthcare, global health equity across the world. We don't want to give that up, right? Um, we've made too much progress. We've seen really a lot of improvement across the world, whether you look at infant mortality and maternal mortality or a whole life expectancy at birth. It hasn't been as dramatic as Rwanda, but nowhere has been as dramatic as Rwanda. Rwanda you know, has shown the steepest declines in mortality ever documented at any time in any place. So we can lift that up as an example of what we should aspire to. I don't see why Americans should be uh, embarrassed to in, uh, elevate the Rwanda example either. Anyway, we'll be pushing uh, to the extent we're invited to comment, but also whether we're invited to comment or not, we'll be pushing the new administration uh, to continue its investment uh, in global health equity uh, in the coming years. So, uh, and we could go to, to specifics. It's just that across the world, a lot of people don't have the staff stuff, space systems and support that are needed uh, to build out health systems. And if you can do that, do programs like our AIDS programs, uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which was the brainchild of George Bush, if we can link that wonderful life-saving intervention to health system strengthening, which we know we can and has been done in some places, including Rwanda, then we'll have more of an impact there as well. But I certainly hope as an American to see um, us involved in helping stem the tide of COVID everywhere, because of course that's the nature of pandemic disease. You can't neglect it in one little corner of the world and expect it to be eradicated. Look at the polio endgame mm. you know, in Nigeria, say, um, which is a, a country with a lot of resources, um, some of which have trickled over to us, some of the Nigerian, I'm not talking about oil, I'm talking about people, some of our best clinicians and teachers, that they, they come from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, so why is it that there's still polio? And that's one of the reasons is a failure to invest in health system strengthening with their oil money, but also because it's so expensive, that end game, you know, of finding the, the last places where there is ongoing polio transmission and then uh, doing the right thing, which again involves not just containment, but care. And uh, you could say, well, what care is there available for polio? First of all, I hope we never see another case on that continent. But anybody who remembers the days prior to the polio vaccine in the United States knows all about iron lungs and other, I've actually seen patients in iron lungs mm. at the Brigham, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, somebody and somebody has spent enormous amount of passion, love, kindness, and technological advancement to keep people going, even when they've had paralytic disease from polio. So, I mean, again, I think uh, we need to look at COVID globally as, you know, our responsibility to engage globally. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, too, and it feeds into an, another question that uh, someone had submitted. Um, so, Dr. Farmer, they say, COVID seems likely to reduce the interest of politicians and to some degree populations in high-income countries around helping others abroad. Uh, what do you think the best paths for advocacy are around this, kind of this apathy or, or a nationalistic sense, right? And to, to break through that, to, to reach out to others uh, in other countries. Well, first of all, notice that the entire global COVID response is nationalistic, right? So it has been around tracing the boundaries of the nation state, which again, 
formerly colonies, formerly empires, uh, but whatever their histories, it's been tracing the boundaries of the nation state and saying, here's what we're doing inside Rwanda or the United States or Canada or Peru or Navajo for that matter, which spans three states in the United States. So, you know, what else are they going to do? That's kind of their responsibility. I get that. I get why national boundaries are so important. You would point out, of course, immediately that the entire pandemic is about trans-border transmission. How would it become a pandemic otherwise, right? So we do need to do some reckoning around the important work of a national team and a national boundary and the trap of nationalism when we're talking about a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's gonna to be tough. The, uh, the therapeutics and preventives, that is new treatments or new vaccines, will challenge this in good ways as well, because it's gonna to have to be about transnational solidarity for sure. Um, regardless of whether we're talking about an American vaccine, an English vaccine, a Russian vaccine, a Chinese vaccine, or whatever vaccine, Indian, it's it, the, the, the number of places where massive production of a vaccine could occur are probably not that large, right? Uh, certainly compared to the 200 or so nations we, we're going to be called to, to think with, mm -hmm. not think about, but think with, and certainly not think for. So I think, you know, we need to understand why nationalism is, plays a role in public health uh, discussions. There are some legitimate reasons and a lot of illegitimate reasons that fly in the face of the nature of infectious pathogens. And I, you know, I think we should spend more time on that in short order. Um, and sometimes it's going to require challenging nationalism, but more often than not, I think it's going to require the call to solidarity. Um, you know, and, and this is not new terrain uh, for people who've looked at vaccines, mm -hmm. right? It's been the nature of vaccines for a long time. Thank you for that. Um, I also want to, I want to get back to the book a little bit because uh, there is uh, just so much wonderful to cover here, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, for folks who uh, have not seen it yet. It's also in the chat, and um, a reminder, today's Giving Tuesday. So if you do want to support Partners in Health and haven't had the chance, you'll find some links in, in the chat. Um, but, you know, as you're writing this book, Paul, and, and uh, you know, the world is evolving uh, around you, and COVID, of, of course, expands around the globe, what, what were you hoping when you saw the book and people began to read it? What were you hoping the message uh, they would take away would be? Well, if you mean when I saw the book in hard covers, it just came out last week. So <laughs> it's still, uh, I'm, it's I'm many still, iterations. I'm, I'm still thinking, oh, yeah, I went through a lot of iterations. <laughs> um, you know, I was trying to write. Uh, I was trying to write for a broad audience and, and some people will laugh. They'll say, oh yeah, that's why you have a hundred pages of end notes. But in fact, that is why I have a hundred pages of end notes because I didn't want to distract the general reader from issues that I regarded as matters of life and death for all of us. And that was well before COVID, right? Of course, you know, um, but it was, it was a, a different exercise, right? Uh, trying to write for a, a, a broader general audience. Mm -hmm. And I had a few people in mind, most of them partners in health people, by the way. And why would I call them lay audiences? Well, because they're, they're, they're managers or leaders or, you know, they're not infectious disease specialists is all I mean, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I had in mind the very people who would be on a call like this as the ideal audience for the book. Now, why did I do that? Uh, because I believe in partners in health and I believe we've never won our argument about the importance of safety nets and health system strengthening. In the past, I've made jokes, you know, going to a college campus and saying, how exciting is that notion, health system strengthening? And the answer is it's not exciting at all, right? You know, uh, I, I one time said, I think somewhere in California, that strange nation on our, where many of our people are calling in from, you know, we should just call health system strengthening Beyonce or something <laughs> a little bit more alluring. So this is really, I, I'm just gonna say to anybody who's watching or listening, this is a really earnest, heartfelt attempt to say, this is important for all of us, uh, and I'm gonna try and lay out why. 
and I'm going to try and get to the tough issues, which are the history of West Africa and the fact that it isn't a different history. It's our history too. I'm going to try and pull people in by saying, hey, meet some of our patients, meet some of our, you know, Ebola survivors. Like I said, painful, yeah. but important to bring people in. And, uh, and that's what I hoped. You know, I, I mean, again, it came out last week, so we'll see. Um, it's not a cheerful book. I get that. It's not a stocking stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> but you need a bigger stocking, Paul. That's bigger all. Bigger stocking. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been wondering, too, if, you know, you, you've been at this for more than 30 years, right, Paul? You and, and a number of uh, co-founders and, and longtime PIHers. And now I hear many of the same words that you're, you've been talking about for decades. You know, the, the idea of lack of space to occupy the need, right? The crush of people arriving in hospitals, yeah. not having enough PPE, the staff, right? The staff trained in shifts that are yeah. endless. So does this all feel almost surreal that finally these words are being spoken in the United States much more frequently than I feel like they probably have been in, in decades past? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the book, I was able to say um, things were getting real all right. And the reason I said that is during Ebola, there were billboards everywhere. It was like, Ebola is real. And I was asking my friends, why are there all these billboards of Ebola is real? You think people who are losing their own family members don't think it's real? You know, and so understanding where that came from and what was going on and, you know, and I'll, I won't talk about that now, but, uh, you know, I was saying things aren't just getting real, they're getting surreal. And uh, I, it does feel surreal. It certainly doesn't feel like a vindication or, you know, like I'm some kind of Cassandra that was saying, we warned you, if anybody wants to say that, let it be Tony Fauci, you know, or someone who has, or Bill Gates for that matter, in his first, uh, his debut in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, he wrote his, his first and maybe his only article for that journal, which is, you know, at Harvard Medical School, that's like the number one medical journal in the world. I can't say that in London, but I can in Boston. <laughs> and uh, he, what did he write about? Health system strengthening and Ebola. And so if Bill Gates, you know, can write about it, you know, uh, why can't we all, you know, learn more about this and why it's important. And again, a safety net. Uh, I can tell you, I have a number of family and friends who fall, uh, who, including who've died of COVID uh, and, and, and those who have lost their jobs or been furloughed. Uh, I'm not talking about distant relatives, you know, and that has been, again, another reminder of why we need to think about things like health system strengthening and safety nets in this country as elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've tried to move that front and center to the discussion of this book as well. So these are just a number of things that I had hoped for. You said, what did I hope for when, you know, in, in publishing the book? Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, I would like people uh, to like it. <laughs> I mean, just like any other writer. Um, I'd like them to be aware how hard it is to write about some of these things. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I hope that'll be clear uh, to the reader as well. And, uh, you know, again, it's not the first time I've used that approach, bringing people by telling them personal stories about our patients and then say, and by the way, you need to know a little bit about the history of this part of the world because it's not dissociated disconnected from our history in the United States either. Yeah, that's funny because we often talk too about when we're telling the stories of PIH, right? Context is key and you have to talk about the people that this directly affects. And I think you did a lovely job in, in the book in, in doing that. Um, uh, one last question, because I know we, we are running out of time well, already, wait. Paul. I know, how does wait, that happen that's every year? <laughs> and this is a question maybe you're tired of answering, but it does regularly come up and uh, I always enjoy hearing your response. So, um, you know, the, in a nutshell, how do you stay optimistic in these times? I think also many people are struggling, right, with the long haul of this pandemic and, you know, the day-to-day the -day, uh, can feel difficult. So how do you uh, stay optimistic? What advice, I guess, would you provide at this moment? Well, I mean, we've been to Sierra Leone together, you and I. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you saw many of our patients there. Um, they're largely young. Uh, they're certainly younger than I am. Uh, and they're stricken with serious ailments or injury, but all of them could recover, or many, many, or most, I say all, but the most. And when we have the staff stuff, space, and systems and support that we need, then we can see them through. So one of the things that gives me optimism is most of our patients get better. I have so many friends in Haiti, particularly who were dying of AIDS 20 years ago. And, you know, like all of us, they'll one day depart this earth, but they're still there, so many of them as coworkers and, and friends. So that's very uplifting, right? And of course, everybody's got their distractions and hobbies. Mine happens to be gardening. But, uh, and don't think that hasn't kept me going through a, a lot of bad things. Um, but whatever the hobby may be, uh, you know, you, it's, it's important to have uh, distractions in this line of work. But I would just add the main thing uh, after the fact that most of our patients get better or would get better if we could do our jobs correctly. Or the other is that, you know, uh, we have a lot of friends and coworkers, right? I mean, I, w I work with, I'm lucky. I mean, I've worked with a lot of the same people for all that time, all those years, uh, you know, and, you know, the director of PIH Russia, I've been working with her for 25 years. The director of PIH Haiti, I've been working with her since 1988. Um, you can do the math and find out how old she is now. <laughs> um, you know, Ophelia, Jim, Todd, you know, since the beginning, we miss Tom White, you know, but um, fortunately, Tom was on the planet for, you know, over 90 years. So, you know, we we can't complain um, ab uh, about some of the people we've lost, um, but most of the people who joined in heart and soul are still working with us. And I think that's one of the most important things to tell students too. And, you know, never try to do something uh, this complicated uh, on your own. This is, this is really teamwork. It's all teamwork. And when you have a good team, like what you saw, what you've seen in, in Haiti or Sierra Leone or Liberia, you know that team in Sierra Leone um, is just so inspiring to me. And I, you know, again, I've only been working with some of them for a few years, right? The leadership we brought in from Haiti, Rwanda, you know, the uh, United States, of course, lo lots of different places. So I knew the leadership for a long time, but I'm just saying, the people I met after 20 in or in 2014 or after awesome people. So uh, I would just encourage people to remember that what we do as individuals isn't going to add up to, to much, um, unless you're an artist or a novelist or, you know, and then, then I get that, right? But in most other spheres of life, you do need partnership. You do need partners. And, in, and that, in fact, is why we called it Partners in Health. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Paul. And I see in the comments, people are giving you praise as well for Bending the Arc, which is the documentary about Partners in Health, right? And is now available on Netflix. So if you haven't watched it, please go there. And uh, again, congratulations, Paul, on your book, Fever, Seeds, and Diamonds. Yeah, I, I see one of my doctor friends uh, from Haiti said, who knew Paul had a hobby? <laughs> go to my house in Haiti and see if you can see through all the trees there. It's like a tropical paradise, I can imagine. And bending, you know, bending the arc, if I could just say one thing, because I did not have to, to I didn't work on the film, right? It, it was the hard work of, you know, the filmmakers, uh, very distinguished document, documentarians. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you to that team, uh, because uh, it is, it is a, an important piece of work, and I think, for those who are not down with reading a 650 page book about <laughs> Ebola and racism, there's always bending the arc. Or you could do a double feature. You know, you could read the book, watch the movie, give to Partners in Health. Uh, one last time I'll mention that today's Giving Tuesday and there is a triple match going on. So you get more for your donation today. Thank you for everyone who has donated. Thank you for your continuous support. Uh, because uh, we wouldn't be doing what we are doing every day without, without you. Um, so do visit partnersinhealthph.org uh, for 
for that opportunity to donate. See us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And Paul, just one last time, I really appreciate uh, getting to talk with you every year, maybe uh, multiple times during the year, uh, and hopefully next time we'll be in person. I love it. And can I just say one last thing to all these amazing people who are listening or commenting, mm -hmm. is we are making progress, you know, and that is the biggest uplift of all human progress. And we're, 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 we're not going fast enough. We have enormous uh, shortcomings uh, as, a, as a society, as a global society, but we're making progress and we will make progress on COVID as well. Thank you, Paul, for that. Happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Leslie. It's such a joy to talk to you too. Oh, thank you, Paul. And I look forward to the next time we get to see each other, virtual or in person. Preferably in person soon. I'm sure. lining up for a vaccine. If anybody has vaccine I'll, hesitancy, I will give you a full update on our next conversation. <laughs> well, take good care. And thank you I to know. everyone who has signed in. I hope you uh, enjoyed this conversation. Me? Um, yeah. I loved it. Oh, no. I know well, you're <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.